Welcome to the Growing Food and Feeding People podcast. Whether you're a backyard gardener, a market gardener, or a small-scale farmer just starting out or a seasoned grower, this show is for you. Join us as we share tips and tricks, tactics and hacks to growing food for yourself, your family, and your community, as well as sharing stories here from the field and other growers and farmers making a difference in their local food webs. My name is Cody, and I will be your host, so let's get growing. All right, episode three, season one of the Growing Food and Feeding People podcast. This show is brought to you by Simply and Easy Media, and this episode is sponsored by Simplistic Farms, bringing fresh local produce to West Michigan, one family at a time. Now, I cannot wait to get into today's topic of discussion because we are going to be asking the question, can an online farm feed an offline community? But before we get into that, You know, I did want to discuss, last year we got into raising worms, you know, for the black gold that they produce, and uh, we were asked, could we ship outside the U.S.? And obviously I had to say no, because I, for one, was not going to contribute to global worming. (laughs) Global worming. Uh, All right, that's the one for this episode. (laughs) So let's jump right into the segment of the show that we like to call This Week on the Farm. So, cows are gone, and I couldn't be more excited. Um, We decided to get rid of the couple cows that we were growing. We had a a real nice heifer and a steer that was ready for butcher. So we ended up working out a good deal with a good friend who happens to be our butcher. And uh, shout out to Swick's Butcher Shop up in Tustin, Michigan. Sold them the cows, and we're getting some beef in the freezer. So, couldn't be more excited. Freezer will be full for the winter, so that worked out good. Needless to say, it was a little bit of a rodeo. Um, I just screwed up, honestly. I wasn't quite prepared. I thought I was. I spent uh, plenty of time, a couple hours in the morning, setting up an alleyway for them um, to back the truck up to and the trailer to get them loaded easily out of the holding pen. Um, And the fence I was using was an electric fence that that they've respected all summer long. but I should have known better uh, because as soon as we tried to load them, oh, Chuck, the steer there, he went right through it. And uh, him and Daisy proceeded to run across the yard, which was fine. I had to take off and cut them off before they headed down the driveway uh, to the road. And luckily, I was able to kind of herd them over to, unfortunately, the garden area, <laughs> which is all fenced in. So it was a good way to kind of trap them. Uh, to eventually get them into a smaller pen and load it up into the trailer and off the farm. (laughs) So it, uh, oh, I suppose, took about an hour longer than it should have. And I should have known better. But again, lesson learned. So the cows are gone. Meat's in the freezer. That is fantastic. Um, As far as the harvest list for this week goes, we did harvest some salad mix, some more watermelons, some peppers, Tomatoes, green beans, bunching onions, some squash, um, and carrots. So it was a pretty good harvest week, and I know our customers were happy. And then we were still doing preserving. I should say Jeannie, queen of canning, was doing some more preserving. And uh, this week was all about the apples. Uh, We got a couple bushel of apples uh, a week or so ago. So she has been busy, busy, busy. Um, making applesauce like crazy. So we're all stocked up on applesauce, canned up some sliced apples for pies later on in the year. I'll probably have a little apple crisp. And she also dehydrated a bunch of apple chips, which are always a great snack. I just love that stuff. So it has been a very busy week. On top of the applesauce, the apple slices, and the dried apple chips, she also made apple scrap jelly. This was the first time, and I think it was a pretty successful experiment. It turned out pretty darn good. So, pretty excited about that. And I'd say we probably made the most out of the apples we could this year. Lastly, this week, we also got started on firewood. Temperatures finally dropped a little bit here in Michigan to make it bearable. Um, so, this is when I really like to put the hammer down and get as much firewood put up for the winter as possible. Um, ideally, all of the firewood we need for the winter. Uh, but we usually end up <clears throat> going out there in the snow sometime in the late, late winter, early spring. But uh, we did get started on that. Uh, got a few loads put up. 
also got into the poison ivy, so that's always fun. Been dealing with that for a few days, but that's all right because that's part of it, you know, it's kind of part of the game. But uh, I think it's worth the trade off. So let's jump right into today's main topic of discussion, and that is can an online farm feed an offline community? Now, let me explain a little bit. Can an online farm on YouTube provide enough value through online agritourism and value based content? to generate enough income to provide the funding to the farm to grow food and feed people without relying on the sale of the vegetables to fund the farm. Now, let me back up a little bit. A uh, while back, I don't know, a month or two, I was watching a video put out by Daniel Arms uh, from Arms Family Homestead. If you haven't watched them, they're a great homesteading channel, and they've been around for years, and they have a large audience. I think they're over 500,000 subscribers now, so they're a large channel. But he put out a video posing the question, is an online farm a real farm? And he went on to explain that people watch his farm for agritourism, you know, to live vicariously through their farm because a lot of people don't have the opportunity um, to go and visit a farm or to, or to have a farm. So they enjoy the livestock, they enjoy the beautiful vegetables, and they also enjoy learning how to do that stuff. He explained, much like, you know, when people would come out to the farm, and you may have a farm stand or a little farm store, people would come out to see the animals, maybe pet the goats, see the chickens, pick up some veggies, and they may also buy some farm merch out of the store, crafts, whatever other value-added products you have for them. So in the world we live in today, which this wasn't available 15, 20 years ago, but now people can visit the farm anytime they want, via these channels on YouTube and other online sources. So now, online agritourism has become a real thing. Subscribers kind of become attached to the farm and want to follow along and see how things progress and how they may be able to implement those things in their life as well. So it's really opened up a whole new customer base for small farms. The Arms Family case, they started their own merchandise line. In between the ad revenue they get from views via their YouTube channel, at no cost to their subscribers and viewers, as well as the merch they sell, they've been able to build an online business that generates enough income to support their offline farm in life. That got me thinking, and that really resonated with me because I originally started our YouTube channel not only to add value and encourage others to grow food, but as an additional income stream for the farm. I understood going in that if we put the work in and built our YouTube channel, that it could eventually be monetized through ad revenue, sponsorships, merchandise, crowdfunding, whatever the case may be, and provide some sort of an income stream for the farm. Okay, I hadn't thought about it as the main income stream for the farm, but that was part of the reason for starting the channel. And I did know that it would take some time. But let me tell you, working in the market garden all day definitely gives you time to think. And one of the main reasons I even started farming, because I really did want to provide fresh, clean vegetables to as many people in my community as possible, as well as encourage as many people as I could locally to start growing food. And with the world being what it's been the last couple of years, a lot more people have gotten into growing and selling food, which I think is an absolute great thing. But with that, the landscape has changed a little bit. Not to mention, with growing a premium product, unfortunately the price you have to get for that product puts some customers out of the market. And that's really what I wanted to try to avoid. So I guess the question is, is my original goal to sell more or to feed more people? Now I can sell more. That just takes a little more marketing. However, what really makes me feel good and full of purpose is when I can drop off a box of fresh veggies to someone who could really use it, maybe wasn't even expecting it, but will always appreciate it. And then I thought to myself, self, maybe the best way to reach more people in the community is to actually remove myself from the market, meaning utilizing other sources of funding to grow and feed, say, 50 to 100 families locally. Because I do love growing food and feeding people, but I really want to serve the underserved, you know, the young family down the street just struggling to survive, or the elderly lady who always grew a garden and hasn't been able to for a few years now good-hearted folks that are doing the best they can during these crazy times and could really use it and may not have access to it on a regular basis. 
I just think when we have to focus on price and sales to run the farm, it alienates part of the community. And honestly, part of the community I want to reach most. I don't want my reach to be based on price. I really enjoy growing food and feeding people, but I love doing it when it's not about the money. And I also really enjoy creating content around the farm for our YouTube channel and this podcast. So Daniel Arm's discussion about online farms being a legitimate income source really got me thinking because the creator economy is alive and well, and I know that, and I think it'd be silly to ignore it. So it hit me. If you can create value-added quality content free to the viewer or listener and build an online business around that that generates enough income to replace the sale of the veggies, I can then feed that family for free, and hopefully ultimately feeding more people in the community than if I were still selling veggies. Now, you might look at that and say, I'm crazy because I'm giving up all of that income that I could have gotten from the sale of the veggies. Even if you could generate, say, $30,000 via your online business so you could feed 100 families, you're still giving up $30,000 worth of vegetable sales, which means you could have ultimately made 60000 But to that, I'd say, well, you're not the first person to call me crazy, <laughs> first off. And then I'd remind you that our goal is to feed people, not sell more veggies. And ultimately, the reality is, I believe over time that that kind of income can be generated via the online business anyway. And I honestly believe that I can reach more people in our community and surrounding areas. Now, you also might ask, why would I profess this now? It's not like I have 100,000 subscribers yet, or I'm getting 10,000 downloads per podcast episode. And I'd say you're right. It'd be really easy to start something like this when I already had that kind of business and income built, when I'm already to that point. But that's the point. Simply and easy, this is real life, and I believe there are many people that will want to join me on the journey, that will want to follow along, that will want to get involved. Uh, at the time of recording this podcast, we are just over 200 subscribers on our YouTube channel, and we just launched this podcast. So we are definitely at the beginning of this adventure, but we all know that the story is written in the journey, not in the destination. And that is what people want to see and be a part of, myself included. You know, it's really easy to see the big shiny star up there, but the path to get there usually looks a little different. And I think it's definitely something worth value and worth sharing along the way. Not to mention, it's a lot easier to reach the destination if you know where you want to go from the start. It also makes it a lot easier to create an action plan and design a business structure around it for the farm. Now, I know it won't happen overnight, and it's going to take a lot more work and effort, and it will take a village. Coretta Scott King said, The greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members. And I believe that wholeheartedly. So I do believe an online farm can feed an offline community, and that is the direction we're going to take with our farm. We are calling it project feed your neighbor and we will be keeping you guys updated every step of the way and definitely invite you to join us on the journey because i honestly believe if we can put this together this really is duplicatable i would love to see other small farms and market gardeners do the same thing yeah! all right you know what that sound means it is time for our farm and garden word of the week and this week our word is vermiculture so, which best describes vermiculture? A, the culture of earthworms. B, the process of garden composting using worms. C, a method to help improve soil structure, texture, porosity, water holding capacity, drainage and aeration, and reduce erosion. Or D, all of the above. Ding, 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 ding. It is D, all of the above. Earthworms are fantastic fantastic for the garden and a good indication of good soil health is if you have a lot of worms in your garden so even if you're not raising worms for the vermicompost hopefully you got some of them buggers wiggling around in your garden so hopefully you have been inspired or entertained learned something or laughed and as always i can't thank you enough for tuning in and following along on this crazy ride we call life if you'd like to continue the conversation you can find us over on facebook at simplistic farms we always like to chat over there. Or you can drop us a comment on YouTube at Simple and Easy Simplistic Farms. 
Now, next week, we are going to break down some numbers for Project Feed Your Neighbor. We're going to set some outlandish goals uh, and talk about our mission going forward. Until then, have a great week. Make somebody smile, and we'll talk to you on the next one.